Good morning, Chris Gott. Um, Chris Gott, of course, is German. Uh, my name is Pastor Dean Swag, and I'm sitting here with um, Lester Rolag, who served in many, for many years in Papua New Guinea with his wife, Elaine. And um, Les is going to share something of his story with us today. And he's written some very helpful notes, which he's going to refer to as he does his talk. So we'll go straight into the questions, Lester. Unlike most missionaries, you were born in New Guinea, as it was then called. Would you like to tell us a little about your early life and school days? Yeah, well, first of all, I was born at the uh, Kakako Mission Hospital at Finchhafen and uh, lived the first two years uh, at Polar at the edge of the uh, uh, Finchhafen Harbour. Dad, my dad, Dave Rollett from New South Wales, he was a uh, diesel mechanic and in those years and for, until the war years, he was a skipper of the uh, Lutheran Mission's uh, uh, shipping vessel, the MV Bavaria. Uh, my mother, was Clara, she was from South Australia and she was a highly qualified nurse. Uh, my mother, my baby sister Eleanor and I we were evacuated to Australia uh, and along with all other missionaries, wives and children uh, about on Christmas Day and Boxing Day of 1941, just before the Japanese attack and uh, took control of Rabaul. Uh, we lived for uh, about one year among and I and my sister next to Dad's parents' place in Walla Walla. Uh, following that, Dad had a posting in Brisbane and uh, we spent three years living at Carina, which was uh, an outer suburb of Brisbane in those days. Uh, nowadays, it's right, very much an inner suburb. Dad worked in the uh, General MacArthur's Allied Geographic Intelligence Section working on the terrain mapping on, on the uh, coastal areas and, uh, and shipping lanes and anchorages and so on along the uh, New Guinea coast between Madang and uh, down to Waialae to Morabi in that time. During those three years there, I did two years of my first two years of primary schooling. Uh, the next year, 1946, I lived at Appala, which was uh, near Appala on my uh, maternal grandparents' side, mum's parents' family farm. Uh, it was, uh, there were no schools in PNG at that time, and obviously I needed schooling. And uh, Dad had gone back to PNG in uh, end of November 1945, one of the first missionaries up there. Uh, and uh, he was busy assembling masses of the US Defence Force war surplus infrastructure that Dr. Fricky and uh, Reverend John Kerner had negotiated to buy from the American Defence Forces, uh, which were to be used for rebuilding mission stations. Uh, my, my mother and two sisters by then joined them uh, in about May, June 1946. So through 1946, I was alone with my grandparents. It's about the end of 1946 that uh, the, New South, the South Australian Education Department began correspondence schooling for the kids of the outback of Australia. And so uh, mum was able to uh, enlist me in that system and uh, brought me to back to the family fold at uh, Finchhafen. And January 1947, I rejoined the family. We did, uh, for that one year, I did correspondence schooling. My mother supervised that, of course. And uh, for a short while, uh, uh, Theora Winter, another, another layman's missionary, his wife also supervised me for a little bit. We were living at Malaoba there at Finchhafen. Uh, that was just for the one year. And then the following two to three years, my sister and I attended a primary school in Hilda at Hillspa, it's also at Finchhafen, uh, under the uh, tutelage of a teacher, Vida Whitehead. Uh, there were uh, had six other children, Australians and Germans, attending that school at that time. And then Catherine Lehman School was opened in 
1951, January 1951, and uh, so we were fa founding students there. We were there for two years, 51, 52. Uh, at that time, my, my dad's first seven year service in the PNG had come to an end, and uh, so the parents had a one year leave entitlement in Australia, and so we all travelled south and uh, they had their holidays and moved around and caught up with relatives and uh, did deputation work. In the meantime, Eleanor and I went into St Paul's College at Walla Walla. Uh, to, uh, the following year, we camped one year then with my grandparents there, uh, dad, family, and then we spent the next four years at St Paul's College. So you went down that track and did you think of seeking a career in Australia or did you think that your life would always be in New Guinea? In 1950 year, I had no idea which way my life would lead me. I worked for a year in Sydney at the Darling Downs Bacon Factory uh, near Sydney uh, for my bread and butter and at the same time I attended leaving certificate night classes nearby. I studied into the wee hours and the nights and uh, this also involved travelling one hour uh, to and fro in between where I was boarding with my uncle and auntie out at, uh, near Penrith, near the foothills of the Blue Mountains and so I was spending two hours of travelling on the train and all this and uh, eventually, yeah, probably about two thirds of the way through the year, that really wore me down and uh, I was getting little sleep and stress issues were building up. So. What next? What's a big thing? What am I going to do now? So I asked God about that and I asked myself. So I marched the streets of Sydney then in the latter part of that year. Uh, I had interviews with several of the big building contractors and uh, they're all saying, well, you're two years, two years really too old. However, when I was interviewed with the, the uh, semi-retired manager of a building company called A.W. Edwards, uh, at the, in a Sydney, uh, they had the headquarters at Glee on the side of the harbour. Uh, he offered me a formal indentured trade apprenticeship in carpentry and joinery. And uh, that was to start in 1959. Uh, that company, A.W. Edwards, was the 10th biggest building company in Sydney of, the t of that time. And now, 60 years on, they're still a very big company. Uh, you can look them up on the web if you want to learn a bit about them. Anyway, I soon reveled in the whole of the scope of uh, the building industry when I started my apprenticeship. I uh, graduated my apprenticeship in December 1962 uh, at top of the class uh, in New South Wales. And those successes, uh, they exposed my wish really to work in LMNG if possible. Sometimes so soon. LM, that's Lutheran Mission New Guinea. Lutheran Mission New Guinea, yeah. yeah. And so you were thinking about that then, and that's about the time you got married? When when did you get married and where did you live? Yeah, uh, we, were, we were married in uh, 1965, and we lived at uh, Leichhardt, which was uh, in a suburb of Sydney at that time. Uh, during that time, uh, Bruce was born and uh, he was a year old by the time uh, we were commissioned to work in LMNG. Uh, on our way up, we spent Christmas of that year, 1966, with parents at Finchhafen and then sailed on Simbang to Madang, January, yep. to formally begin work. So most people in the mission had various postings or assignments during their time in New Guinea. Would you like to give us a an overview of your long working life, which included participating in the transition from mission to Indigenous church. In Madang, in regard to building and maintenance and actually doing things uh, with my hands and so on, uh, we began with, uh, I had to do three months of managing the Madang joinery shop, and we had about eight staff there at the time and produced uh, joinery, household joinery for the whole of the mission field. Uh, in due course, uh, someone was recruited from, from Australia and took, took over there. So then I moved into building and first of all was a uh, significant bell tower. It was built 
at the Memorial Church in Medang that was designed by architects here in Adelaide and uh, put on a new roof in, the, in, in, in their church hall there. I built a duplex homes and the, it was at the housing compound called DCA uh, for mission staff. Uh, I did extensions and alterations to the mission supply house, quite a large centre. You can learn about that from some other people, I suppose. And built a recreation hall at the Egal Hospital. This is when I was in Lane. Built uh, two dormitories and a kitchen and a chapel at the Asua uh, Leprosy Hospital. Built a, and the last job there was to build the aircraft hangar at, at Medang for Luther Air. And then, of course, there were very smaller jobs. So this sounds like the time when the mission already had quite a lot of infrastructure, but then that, that was expanding and there are all kinds of projects that you were involved in, as we can, as we've heard. And um, would you like to tell us a bit about design and drafting some of the buildings that you? Yeah, well, this, this was quite about the time when, when there were hardly any more new mission stations being built, and, yeah. and the, the the expansion was in other facilities yeah. um, for education and, and uh, medical services and so on. So in the meantime, then also because I had. Uh, Learned to do uh, drafting and drafting, drawing, designing and and uh, drafting plans or blueprints, as the Americans say, for buildings. In my studies in Sydney, uh, I uh, did most of it. Always had to do this after hours because we we're looking after projects and the workers during the day. Uh, so we designed drawings for two long dormitories, at, yeah, dormitories at Yagam Hospital. Uh, Rabaul Missionary Residence for Max Deemer. The uh, Lutheran Mission was then about to open up mission work in West New Britain, and uh, so this was to be the first missionary's residence. Uh, West Karaka Church. I think that, that, that withstood the earthquake, didn't it? Or it, they, was, it was one of the buildings. I designed a church for that yeah. at, at the same time, and those are the only two buildings in the whole of Rabaul that didn't fall or get squashed. So, that's quite they a tribute. Got, they had a quite a tribute to, to your work, Lester. Yeah, well, yeah. when I decided that, did those things, I decided, well, we knew that there was possible ash and all this sort of stuff and that. So I just designed the roofs a little steeper and built them stronger, or designed them stronger. And basically that was what it was all about, that shed the ash. Most of the other buildings collected ash and when the yeah. rain came on it, that too weight and the roofs fell in and all sorts of things happened. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so then, uh, yeah, Garaka Community Hall, uh, two ward blocks, uh, designed those for the Etep Hansonite, Hansonite Hospital. And the so Hansonite. there's a little hospital out in the bush, isn't it? Yeah, up in the mountains. Yeah. And, and uh, those were funded by Stamps for Missions, which was a project uh, of the, uh, the Australian Northern Youth in those times, and that program's still going on. So now we're moving on to your years in lay. So you've already done some really quite big pieces of work, but now you move into a really big project, the building of the campus at Martin Luther Seminary. So I ask you to talk about that and what followed after that then. Well, it was, it was the largest project that I got involved with supervising later. It was a $700,000 project, or I keep yeah, those dollars in those days, or a little over $700,000. That uh, was the budget, and uh, which in today's terms, if you look on the so web, is be several million, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, uh, the web says about four point nine to five million dollars. Yeah, anyway, something like that, even just by comparison purposes. So there were significant buildings there: two-storey uh, concrete block classrooms and this and that, and dormitories and so on. Uh, we completed that on time and on budget. Uh, Clem Junetsky from Wabak, who was my, came down, was my leading foreman at that time, and we had two or three nationals who were also well, good leading hands, so that went well. Yeah, so when that was completed then, uh, we moved into UMPO, and I took over the management of UMPO Builders, which was a branch of Lutheran Technical Services. Most of the other branches were of technical services were mechanical workshops. So, so this is going to be for quite a long stretch, isn't it? 72 until yeah, yeah, 84. Yeah, 1972 to 84, I was managing yeah. up that building. Uh, 
during that time I had between uh, 40 and, and 50 people, most of them all nationals and most of them were tradesmen and we covered all the trades except electricians for electrical work we subcontracted to a company in town. Uh, it was a busy time, I really enjoyed that. Uh, during that time I had uh, uh, expatriate assistance in the earlier years, three times, three different gentlemen were with me for two years as kind of my, my general supervisors. Uh, uh, first was Ian Pfeiffer, a uh, former mission builder. Uh, it was Bert Graham and then a gentleman called Jeff Eggins. So we had many, many projects over those years at Lay and at other centres and uh, on various outstations. At the same time then I was doing designing and drafting, doing quantity surveying and estimating as I'd been done before uh, for many buildings. Uh, mostly for the education and medical departments for the LCPNG and uh, the shipping, the shipping services. Uh, these are necessary again were done, uh, done after hours, so sometimes I wonder how I managed a lot of my hobbies and things that I used yeah. to do, but anyway, when you're young and you're feeling active, uh, you manage to you get want, more you than what you do. do. Fit a lot in a short time, yeah. yeah. Anyway, and, and interestingly, someone said, hey, uh, you built the last of the mission stations, which was one that tipped it. it okay, it wasn't way up in there. Yeah. That would have been quite a feat because that's way up in the mountains and yeah. there's only a small airstrip. Yeah, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't the whole station, though, because it didn't have the workshops yeah. and all the other stuff. It, yeah. was a, it was a full residence where the missionary would stay for a few months or whatever as he trekked around. And so, here we go, mission station. Uh, I was a member of the Morrowby Provincial Building Board for quite a few years uh, as a representative of the Protestant churches. Uh, I was also a member of the uh, board of the Governors of Lake Technical College for many years uh, and uh, one or two of their subcommittees at times. Uh, my time there uh, lasted longer, well, longer than four different contracted headmasters over three years, three year terms. And so that was a quite Quite a big extra commitment because that's a, that was a big project. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, well, it was it was, uh, uh, it was recognised in the latter years as a preeminent in the preeminent category worldwide in technical training colleges. Yeah, it was a government institution. Moving into the next chapter of your career up there, and you've called it the CCA years, but you have to tell us what CCA is. Well, CCA came, that, that, that stands for Church Construction Advisor. Okay. It was at a, So that was your new title? For this it was period? a new title. Yeah. And I, I had handed over Managing Lumpo Builders to Mr. Don Weir. Yeah. And uh, so I was on my own, and after a little while I had a trainee draftsman with me. At the, uh, it was at a time when the, most of the people of the ELCPNG were transiting from the days when they worshipped in a large uh, circuit church generally built or organised by the early missionaries who built the large circuit uh, ch church at, at or near one of the biggest villages and people would come and go from up, yeah. up to an hour of always walk for their Sunday services, for their meetings and this sort of thing. And, and by There's the a bit night, like that at Saddleburg, isn't there? Yes. And the people always used to come and then uh, this is a transition to congregational life. A congregation and people wanting to have their, con their church in the their village. Church in village. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the one at Earl and one at Dinesville Hill or other ones, similar kind of situations. Yeah. There were quite a few of those around. So there was there was a big push by the push by the district presidents at uh, at the Senate then at uh, 1984 for a dedicated church architect, is the way they put it. And that, that target was, yes, what we call front-end design, that is, for churches and mansions to get the design, drafting, preparation, lists of materials and, and so on, so that the people then could start building, maybe yeah. in stages. Sometimes they only had funds to, to get the main frame up and the roof on and it might be another two or three years before they could uh, uh, put some floors in and some walls and so on. And so so these, on. these were buildings of a, of a kind of simple but durable design? Yes, it was, uh, 
most churches are built in the early stages. They were, uh, yeah, general, most of them were pretty simple, uh, low cost as we could do it. Yeah. Uh, coastal ones had, had semi-open sides in the all, and the Highland ones were closed in. And a lot of the congregations had some different ideas. Some of them could provide their own, some of their own materials, generally gravel and sand for concrete if possible, maybe rocks to build and rock outside walls or yeah. timber, or they didn't have. Maybe they wanted to start with a thatch roof, uh, depending on, on, on funds. There were a few quite significant and somewhat costly ones where some congregations were quite ambitious and we had a hexagon shape structure of it. We had a Mendy there at one, one stage and different ones like that. But it was very interesting. However, in those years, 85 to 1994 then, uh, probably about 60% of my time was doing these designs and estimating drafting drawings for uh, other buildings for the ELCPNG, for the medical services and education department, and shipping facilities, Luther Shipping was expanding at that time. And so these were the departments with money ready to go. And yeah. so uh, let's have those if you don't mind. So you said 60%, but it was really like two jobs, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two well, two different targets. But my, yeah. my first priority when I could give it was to the national people. and. Uh, uh, and to, to, to organise a set of drawings for a congregation, if possible, I would go there or travel there, road, fly there, or ship or whatever. Uh, sometimes I can't there, can't get there. The the elders, two or three of the elders and the pa pastor would come and visit me in my office. But if I could get there, we could discuss it or find out how many people about they want to be able to sit in there, how much growth they might have, where they want to put it, uh, how we would align it. Uh, I'd collect a couple of samples of soil from about a metre underground so that I could design the suitable size uh, foundations. And then when I got back home, well, I'd, I'd start out on, uh, I did the drawings, this set of drawings would be four sheets. I think they're called A1s, they're about yeah, so wide and about so high and it'd have the floor plan and all the drawings of the, the elevations, the different sides and the ends of the building on the one and the, and the next one would have the, all the foundations and all the concrete details, reinforcement and so on. The, the, the third sheet would have the steel or timber frames or framework on it. And then the other prime one was the site plan, which the building boards always required. All public buildings in all my time there had to be approved a, by a structural engineer. They would look at the drawings and they would assess them. They'd give me a certificate. And then they would be submitted to, to the building board, no matter which province they were. And the uh, building board, then, which I was on one earlier on, I knew what they were after, uh, would ensure that they're happy with all their regulations because yeah. it's a public building. And they've got to ensure that nobody puts up a public building. And it's also earthquake country, isn't it? The it whole is. Lot, so you have to make them all the designs strong. We were on stage three and a stage four of most of the PNG, so. And so had the earthquake code requirements. And you talk about a sea change. Yeah. Well, so this, this is going to be interesting. A little bit different. Yeah. What yeah. was the sea change? Well, I think it must have been end of '94, whatever. Ella and I were down here on leave and, and having our meeting with the uh, overseas missions director, Dr. Ulf Metzner, in his office uh, in North Adelaide there. And uh, yeah, he said, um, sadly, but we've got serious restraints with the overseas mission budget. Uh, we can't support you anymore. Uh, we are withdrawing all of our lay staff. You're one of the last ones, and we're just hanging on to the missionaries up there, the few missionaries if we can. And uh, uh, that word got up to the LCPNG, and the, and the bishop then was Gataka Gum, yeah. who I, you, we know him very well. Uh, I think his nickname was Blue, wasn't it? Because he had red hair. It was unusual for him to begin with. Anyway, so he got his heads together and they sent out an urgent message. Look, uh, we can't, we got to have this That's service sort of still going. Yeah. we got to have it. Anyway, so the mission board, they struggled and they said, OK, we'll, we'll, send, we'll send you back for two years on a half salary. I can't remember just how all of that was sorted out. Uh, and during that time, but he had a good idea and he said, look, uh, at this time, uh, you're getting involved with a lot of donor projects that they were, the LCPNG was applying for overseas funding, donor yeah. aid funding for a lot of community type projects. And uh, 
So he said, uh, why don't you think about the idea of charging these projects a standard fee yeah. that, that yeah. architects and engineers or project managers would charge. And they had standard rates in the future. We moved into that and uh, so I started charging 80% of what was then standard PNG industry rates for the services that I provided. These amounts of money that were collected in that way were sent to, uh, to Adelaide to, to uh, recover, uh, to repay the salary that they continued to, to pay us to keep me there. Everyone seemed to think that this was pretty much a win-win situation and about 20% less than they would have otherwise done had we been used commercial architects and, and uh, project managers. And, uh, and also, uh, well, they knew that I was pretty dedicated to the work there, and probably more so than uh, anyone from the town company who's doing this sort of work for us. It looks as if you also were doing another big piece of work in, in property development and project management services. Yeah, the church had a couple of staff doing some of the book work with the donor agencies, but they still needed someone from the building site to organise architects and engineers for designing these yeah. things. Okay. I, was, I was not doing that. I was just coordinating that sort of stuff. Uh, so property development and project management services was the name they gave to my office again this time. And uh, so in, in addition to continuing with drafting and designing plans and helping congregations and, and other pro projects, it included yeah, helping to get these projects to jump through all the hoops that's required by the overseas donor agents before they would release funds and most of them at that time, most of them probably were coming from the Lutheran World Federation, yeah. there were applications to Sweden or Swedish Lutheran Church I think and obviously you see Germany and no idea was there. And the other side of that, the property management side of it was that some of the districts and circuits were acquiring properties or had properties they wanted to develop or develop more than what they already had in regard to infrastructure. Uh, Mount Hagen uh, District Centre was one of them and uh, the Mendy was starting a whole new property uh, where they wanted to set up their headquarters and there were certain other ones too. And so very briefly, that would mean I would go there, uh, organise a site plan, measure everything up, uh, see where the slopes, the drains and, and everything else and decide where's the best place to put different buildings and, and how they'd coordinate them on there. Together with their leaders, we discuss yeah. all this. Uh, and the, like uh, at Mendy, there they were wanting obviously their head offices and meeting rooms. They wanted a community hall. Uh, I think a couple of residences uh, for chair. And uh, there was a women's work centre, toilet block, and all this. And I would draft all this stuff up and then yeah. hand it over to them. And they would then decide what they want to do. And most of these drawings, they would choose from my file of drawings that I had. And important in all this is, of course, doing actual church buildings and designs for those. Would you like to tell us about that? It's 1985 when I started, uh, so-called CCA Church Construction Advisor, and until nearly when we finished in 2002. Uh, yeah, I think I already described how I'd set up a set of drawings. Yeah. For sometimes it's five drawings, depending how complex the build, building was. Uh, I was concentrating on doing that, and I had a, a, an understudy draftsman who was also doing a fair bit with me. Uh, so we completed 58 different church designs. So I said mostly low cost, and relatively simple, yeah. uh, difficult for the highlands that's, and coastal that's areas. A, that's actually a big number. It is. No duds and all that. <laughs> yeah, well, very briefly, it took me about two weeks on an average. Yeah. I had other work to do with the uh, maintenance of uh, missionary residences and committees and all that sort of stuff, but about two weeks to to do all the drafting and then measure off all the materials right down to the last packet of screws and the last door lock or whatever, list them all, check all the latest prices and list it all up, get a final price on it and ready to into that the congregation, this is what it's cost, how much do you want to do now with your drawings. I've already got them through the building board for you. You organise your builders, or well, maybe umpire builders, if I was an umpire builders, I could send, they can probably send a foreman and two men up to lead you guys and you guys do it. 
that sort of thing happened a lot. And in addition to those, then another 91 congregations that are provided to church drawings to, in these cases, they would come down or I would take to them four or five of the drawings that were I had the, the, the traces or the blueprints and they would look at them and decide, oh, well, we'd like this one that's about our size, but we want, want to be able to extend it this way or that way. Yeah. Uh, so you, you will have that. So I'd go back and I would have to redraw that. And there was 91 churches and it was spread across CSC, oh, yeah. quite a few on CSC and uh, through the Highlands and all over. The, well, I left that. Uh, I left behind then all of these blueprints in special folders, they all hang on there, dozens of them, by church sizes. So whoever followed me in my understudy did this for some years, I don't know where they are now, uh, would have been able to help them to do the same sort yeah. of thing. What you did was actually sustainable. You know, you could have that was the whole on. idea. Because the climate and, the, and also with earthquakes and whatever, it's pretty rough on buildings, isn't it? It was, especially on the Hillsborough schools. Those yeah. early builders didn't know any better. There were probably not any serious building codes. And most of those one and two story buildings for for the, all the schools at Hillsborough were built with homemade concrete bricks. No binding re steel reinforcement through them either way, no locking down. And so these crumbled, some of them just about fell right down. Others had all sorts of damage. Quite a few had to be rebuilt. So that was a major project. Insurance covered quite a lot of that, but I spent a lot of time on that project. Uh, and Saddleberg too had a, had a fair bit of damage. Interesting. Got a list of um, other projects that you were working on in this. Well, interesting one was the uh, Cesano Lagoon Tsunami Disaster Project. And the tsunami wiped out a village and, and, and drowned hundreds of people and uh, destroyed a village at Cesano up in the north coast past Weewak. This is in the Catholic area, and so the, the Catholics had organised a whole program of rebuilding the village, the school and the medical aid posts and so on, well inland, away from the coast, relocating all the people. And uh, so we were invited to help in that project, and so the Lutheran Church, ELC, PNG, uh, donated two double classroom blocks for that, and for that then I did the drawings and went up and checked it a couple of times, it was a very interesting project, uh, working with the Catholics in that regard, they were very good. Uh, I did designs for Barnes Agricultural School, new dormitories there. Uh, another significant project was uh, was in charge of coordinating a $3 million ELC PNG primary schools upgrade. Uh, I think we had about 240 or 250 primary schools. LC, PNG, villages, and teachers and so on. And so this was to help a lot of those. And it was relatively simple, we designed it. They wanted a residence and a double classroom block and as many as they could get for that money. I designed a very low cost, but adequate. So there were some other projects, yeah. um, 20 or so, but just picking up on one, that Asiawe village, what, what is, what's that one? Yeah, Asiawe village was the name given to a property that the ELC PNG received due to Namasu folding up. When that folded up, there's property that the Hotel Cecil near Boko Point at the, in the heart of Lay came into the hands of the church. And the church said, what are you going to do with that? Well, in the end, they decided they want to build some investment properties on it for an assured income to go with the income they could earn from Lutheran shipping. And this was at a time when the overseas partner churches' budgets were getting tighter and tighter and there was less financial support to help the projects and, of course, always uh, uh, their own income through giving from the congregation was always generally pretty inadequate for what they wanted to do. Yeah. So uh, on, on there then uh, uh, we built, we had contractors build 28 two-storey, very high security, high rental investment units, uh, accommodation units, and uh, they were built in stages over about three to four years. Uh, they also had a couple of tennis courts and a twin swimming pool, they had a high security security fence. Uh, we put on daytime guards, three daytime security guards who were, who were hired from security company and a dog, and uh, same at night. 
and the rent rate, I can't remember, it was pretty high, probably about, well, I thought it was high at the time, about $1,400 a month. Yeah. During all these years, you were, besides all the work that you were doing, you were on a number of um, church committees. committees. Okay, on, on committees, then, well, then, got involved with quite a few there. Uh, in our congregation, we worshipped at Resurrection Lutheran Church in town, and we were members there for 34 years. So. It's a record, for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I've been, been preached for that stair a number of times. <laughs> and uh, One of so those, I remember, I turned up, I didn't know I'd be preaching, yeah. but the preacher hadn't turned up. Yeah. So I got dogged in. <laughs> I can remember that. And, and you wouldn't have known the difference, you know, except that we knew that the pastor hadn't there. And sometimes Dean would, uh, he went out fishing with me two or three times, and now and again he, he would bring that little hint in about fishing for people or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was good fun. And I, I council member for 13 years and then three years as the uh, a chairperson and then I was a treasurer for 16 years uh, before the nationals would agree because they was become nearly all nas national members in the latter years would agree to have someone amongst their own who they thought they could trust as a treasurer. I was working on the Upper Housing Management Committee. That was a small committee that, that did monthly meetings. Uh, and a compound that had a lot of residences on it. I was a representative for the Morrowby uh, District and the Island Districts uh, for most of my 33 years there. Uh, the Cumberland Holdings, I was on the Board of Governors there, uh, acting as a secretary and uh, mainly infrastructure advisor. Uh, most of their business with was operating and managing Lutheran shipping, which was becoming quite a large concern. And if there were some uh, major floods uh, that displaced thousands of people around the outer edges of outskirts of Lay at one time there. And so a tent city development committee was set up. I was on that. Uh, and uh, there were about lots organised for about 900 blocks for homes and plus a community services centre out towards Pumayam High School and uh, it was a project coordinated between ELC, PNG and the provincial government. It was a busy time and then a small, small committee, a church revolving loan fund committee which was helping congregations build churches to them alone and then they paid back. Yeah. So thank you for sharing with us this morning. And sorry for all the reading. It's all fine. God bless you and um, Elaine too. Thank you. Thanks a lot.